Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Chip Coldren. I'm a uh, project director for the Smart, Poli Smart Policing Initiative, working with BJA and, uh, and CNA on uh, technical assistance and training for this program. We now have uh, over 30 police departments and communities involved in this initiative around the country. Uh, uh, a while ago, probably o over a year ago, we initiated a, a series of webinars around topics related to smart policing. We've had them on research and performance measurement. We've had them on place-based policing. We've had them on offender targeting. Uh, we're developing some on cost-benefit analysis and sustainability. So this is a kind of an ongoing and a growing series of webinars. Uh, we've recorded most of them, so if you don't know, it is possible to go to the Smart Policing website and, and view uh, uh, one of our previously recorded webinars. So those are available. I encourage you to take a look at them if you have the time. Today we have Mike Scott, who is a professor at University of Wisconsin Law School and uh, the head of the Problem-Oriented Problem Policing Center. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with that center. If you're not, you should be. And I think it's fair to say that problem-oriented policing is central to almost every smart policing initiative that's being instituted around the country. Uh, many departments are conversant with it. Uh, many pick very focused problems to work on. And they do their best to follow the SARA model and the POP model. So I think today, we're going to get something that's a little bit more than a basic orientation to POP, uh, probably something at the, in, at the intermediate level. And we've asked Mike to uh, look at uh, the current implementation of problem-oriented policing and how that relates to smart policing. Uh, he's done a very good job putting this together. He's been extremely cooperative, and I know that we'll have a good session. I just want to mention a couple other things. As I mentioned, these sessions are recorded. And we have a fair number of participants on the line today, probably well over 60 or 70. So it's not going to be easy to have everybody chime in. We have times during the presentations where we ask for comments and questions. So it's not going to be easy for every, everybody to chime in uh, over the phone and ask their question. You'll see that there is a chat function, and we record that as well. So if we're going through the webinar and you have a question or a comment that you want to make, please feel free to use the chat function, and we usually get a kind of a healthy dialogue going on there as we're going through the, the, the slides. Uh, we at CNA will make sure that if there's any questions that are not answered, we will go through the chat uh, dialogue and make sure that we get an answer to every question that's asked at some point in time. We will also, at the end of this, we'll send out a brief evaluation form. Uh, we encourage you strongly to... Uh, Take a look at that and fill it out, uh, you know, very honestly and, and forthrightly. We pay very close attention to them. And as we think about building out this webinar series and maybe modifying some of our current classes or adding some new ones, the comments from uh, the evaluations actually play a very central role in that. So please, please pay close attention to that when it comes to you. I think that's all. Uh, Vivian Chu is our able moderator here. So, uh, and Mike Scott, uh, I think I'll turn it over to you, okay? Okay, very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good morning if you're west of me in Wisconsin. Uh, I've been asked to talk about problem-oriented policing and its connection to smart policing. So I'm going to give a quick overview of some aspects of the problem-oriented policing approach and also uh, a review of some of the resources that are available from the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing. So I'll talk uh, uh, for about 10 minutes uh, and then stop and take questions and comments and then, and then resume. So uh, one of the, the first questions is, so what, what is this connection of smart policing to problem-oriented policing? Well, my take on it is that Smart Policing Initiative is a federally funded initiative to help police agencies implement various policing innovations that emphasize using data analysis and research to improve police practice. So Smart Policing itself is not a policing theory, 
but rather it draws upon the best principles and methods of other theories like problem-oriented policing, community policing, intelligence-led policing, hotspots policing, evidence-based policing, and so forth. And all those distinctions and parallels are not terribly important uh, for our purposes today. They're more important for, for theoretical reasons. As many of you know, the, the problem-oriented policing idea has been around for over three decades now. It was first articulated in 1979 and, and fleshed out uh, in a complete book in 1990. In preparation for this webinar, it invited you to take a look at some background information on the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing website. Uh, and and uh, this page with a, a nice picture of Herman Goldstein, who developed the concept on it, you can click on these links and uh, read more about the, the basic elements of the problem-oriented approach and, and different aspects of it. What I want to do is uh, organize my, my talk around the, the SARA problem-solving model. SARA is just one of a, a, a number of different problem-solving models. This is probably the best recognized one in, in the police uh, profession. And SARA, of course, stands for scanning analysis, response, and assessment. So beginning with uh, the scanning phase of the process, we think about what are the, what is scanning about? What are the goals? Well, the main goal is to, is to describe the impact that a particular crime or disorder problem is having on the community and on the police department in its handling of that problem. And that includes describing and counting as, as best you can the volume of incidents, the number of times police have to deal with that particular problem, chronicling how much harm it's actually causing to the community, how much it's costs, it costs the community and the police department to deal with that particular problem. And that might be both monetary costs and non-monetary costs like fear of crime. Secondly, the, the goal of, of scanning is to get some sense of the priority that this particular problem has for the community and for the police department. As all of you practitioners know, police departments are dealing with literally hundreds of different kinds of policing problems every day. And not every one of them can be a top priority. So in the smart policing, you're selecting from among all of the stuff that police have to do a few problems that, that merit special attention. You're also trying to get a sense in the scanning phase of what, what is the likelihood of success. I'm getting some sense, if we put some significant extra effort into this particular problem, is there some reasonable likelihood that we will come out of it with an actually improved response to the problem? Not all problems are, are ripe for dealing with at any particular time. And that's partly an assessment of what kind of resources do we currently have available to throw at this particular problem? Uh, how much knowledge do we currently have about the problem, uh, both within our jurisdiction and how much is known generally in the profession? And most importantly in the scanning phase, we're looking to paint an accurate and a precise picture of the problem. We want to define it as precisely as possible. We often say that problems often are not what they first appear to be. Uh, this is a, a, a simple example from one of the SPI sites that I've been doing some work with in Glendale. Um, they identified an abandoned house, one abandoned house, as a particular problem that they were going to, to focus on. And for a variety of reasons, it turned out that that one house didn't really justify spending a great deal of time and effort uh, in dealing with because it, it turned out not to be causing quite the problem that, that, that was first imagined. But dealing with uh, all of the abandoned houses in the jurisdiction might have proved to be too big of a problem. And so the dealing with the abandoned houses was, uh, I think, wisely decided to be dropped from the Smart Policing Initiative, all part of this scanning phase. 
Well, how do we scan for problems? I, I use this metaphor of, of some kind of a radar system or a satellite dish, scanning the environment constantly, looking for problems that demand special attention by the police. And every police agency needs to develop a multiple uh, multiple methods of scanning its environment to to identify problems. Some of those will include just having officers get out and talk to citizens. Citizens will tell police, if asked, what are the problems of concern in their community. Obviously, many police departments have advanced records management systems with crime mapping, and so mapping out uh, the incidents is another helpful way of visually trying to see where problems are clustering. Third way might be going to community meetings to try to get to move beyond just the single individual and one perspective, but trying to get a broader sense of what is a, a larger community think about problems. Reading the newspapers. Uh, the press isn't always all that great at solving problems, but they do have a special capacity for identifying problems, especially those that they think need attention and are not, not being solved effectively. Systematic surveying of the community can also be a useful scanning tool, as can using anonymous tip lines for people who are otherwise reluctant to tell police what's bothering them. Looking through the records management systems. And finally, and, and not to be forgotten, is systematically interviewing uh, one's own police officers. The police officers themselves oftentimes see things in their routine uh, duties uh, that don't necessarily come to official attention through the reporting systems. So we want to involve in, it, it, apply as many of these met methods as we can in scanning for problems. The problems can be defined in four basic ways. Um, the, the most basic way that we define problems is by the behavior. So we're looking for incidents that are connected in one way or another. And in this context, we're, we're looking for all of those incidents that might have similar problematic behavior at issue. Some of these relate to criminal uh, statutes and violations of the law, such as panhandling, robbery, assault, speeding, drug dealing. It's behavior that's occurring maybe in many different places involving many different people, but the common denominator is the behavior. The second way we can define problems is by the location. It's all that stuff, all those different behaviors, perhaps, by different people that are occurring at that one bar. All those things that are happening at that one intersection, in that one neighborhood, at that one house, in that apartment complex. Thirdly, we could define problems by the people involved. So we very often think of gang problems, and gang is sort of shorthand for all of the different kinds of problematic crimes and behaviors that, that members of gangs involve themselves in. But we cluster it and, and identify, define it as a, a gang problem. So too with mentally ill people, chronic inebriates, repeat offenders, repeat victims, and so forth. What's important to remember here, especially when defining problems by people, is that the people definition is really just shorthand for the behaviors underlying uh, the problem. So we want to be careful that we don't define a problem too literally as mentally ill people, with the implication that maybe if we could just get rid of mentally ill people, the problem would go away. That's, that's, that's the wrong way to think about it. We want to be much more precise in asking what exactly is it about the behavior of mentally ill people that, that merits our attention. And finally, we couldn't define problems by the time, the time at which they occur. This could be all of that stuff that occurs uh, every weekend night around the bar closing time, all of that problematic behavior that occurs around the annual festival, whether it's Mardi Gras or Halloween or the, the street racing events, whatever it might be, or all that stuff that occurs around rush hour. So there are various ways in which we can define problems, and you can imagine that a very precisely defined problem might actually involve all four dimensions. <clears throat> so as an example, a problem like disorderly youth in an entertainment district on weekend nights incorporates all of the four dimensions, the behavior, the people, the location, and the time. We also know the problems can be defined and addressed at different scope, at, a, at different levels of aggregation. 
Some problems, for example, lend themselves to being dealt with at a highly specific location. We're dealing with just this one budget motel or even just one individual who could be generating a high rate of calls for service. Other problems make more sense to deal at a, at a broader level, such as a neighborhood. could be drug dealing and speeding are the kinds of problems that often manifest really at the neighborhood level, not just at one particular block or intersection. Other problems better to take on at a district-wide level, and then there are some problems that it really does make sense to take on at the entire jurisdiction level because they cut across all the jurisdictional lines within the uh, all the boundaries within that jurisdiction. This is a, a theory called a theory of small winds that I came upon uh, several decades ago, and it always made a, a great deal of sense to me. It pointed out to me the importance of defining problems in as narrow and precise a fashion as possible. This theory says that uh, and this applies beyond just policing, that when we define social problems too broadly, we tend to get overwhelmed by the breadth of that problem, and consequently we lose some of our capacity to deal with that problem effectively. It's too hard, for example, to take on the problem of drug abuse in our communities, the problem of generally of crime and disorder. But what we can do is we can take on smaller chunks of that, the larger problems, and the theory suggests that as we have successes and at the smaller micro level, it builds up our confidence, it builds up our expertise, it builds up the resources necessary to take on progressively larger problems. Pretty important theory, I think, and so I'd encourage all of you as much as possible to try to define your problem as precisely as possible. Drawing from some of our SPI sites, you can see that some of these, how some of our jurisdictions have defined their problems. In Glendale, Arizona, one of the problems we're looking at is thefts of beer from Circle K convenience stores. Obviously, they've defined the problem in terms of both behavior and particular locations. In Reno, Nevada, the problem is prescription fraud and abuse. Really cutting across the entire jurisdiction, many different people at many and no particular time, but the common denominator, the problem is defined in terms of the behavior. In Savannah, Georgia, the problem was defined as high rate violent offenders, with those, uh, an emphasis on the, the people dimension of the violent offenders. But it turned out that they also went on to identify the problem in somewhat geographically by focusing on uh, those offenders who are operating in one fairly small district within the center part of Savannah. And as you, you look through the list of all of the current SPI sites, you can just see fairly quickly that different jurisdictions have defined their problems in different dimensions, but also at different, uh, different scopes. Gun-related homicides across the whole of Baltimore, violence but only in particular neighborhoods in Boston, robbery in Cincinnati, but only in a more narrow uh, neighborhood uh, around Warsaw Avenue, and so forth. There isn't one absolute way in which one can define these problems. You can see a bit of the variation. Continuing through into other jurisdictions, drug-related crime in Lowell, robbery and burglary in a whole district of Memphis, robbery of immigrants across all of Palm Beach County, street violence in selected areas in Philadelphia, and so forth. To summarize, in the scanning phase, as what we're attempting to do is to paint a picture of the problem and to, and to make an argument, make the case as to why people should care about it. Why does this problem merit special attention by the police and others at this particular time? In doing that, we want to precisely and accurately define the problem as to its behavior, its place, the people involved, and the times at which it's occurring. And remember, again, that this is often the case. The problems are not what they first appear to be. Okay, so why don't we uh, pause there and see if there are any, any comments. The leader questions. has unmuted your line.
Mike, Tom Fraser, can you hear me? Yes. Um, when we did the, the, the back to your vacant housing issue, uh, we did a similar thing in Baltimore, where and, and sort of the rule of thumb was if you had three vacants on a block, you're probably going to lose that block. And then, then we went through and color coded the blocks green, yellow, red, and, and tried to have a, a multi service approach to turn yellow to green and connect green to green and, you know, have a strategic uh, approach to uh, using the, the vacant housing uh, metric as a, as a baseline. Did, 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 was any of that kind of an approach, or was, was the whole vacant housing thing abandoned? Or, and I can't remember what city it was. Uh, that was in, in in Glendale. Is anybody on from from Glendale? <laughs> okay, not sure that we have anybody on the on the line from Glendale. Uh, hi, this um, is this is Mike White. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, Mike. Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought I was unmuted, but I I was. <laughs> okay. Do you want to comment on that, Mike? Sure. Uh, Essentially, what we had done is, in the scanning process, we had identified three separate problems, and um, the really the first problem, which was the, the theft problem from Circle K's, was much larger than we originally anticipated. So the idea was that if we were going to target that one location and develop a model for that one house that we could use then to move on to others, but we got so wrapped up in problem one and problem two that we... we kind of had to set it aside and never really got to it. But I, I certainly like that idea that you just described in terms of color coding blocks based on the number of abandoned houses, and uh, that's very interesting. And the, the hard part in that is getting all the city services to coordinate because you're going to need uh, code enforcement, health, uh, probably public works. And if you can do that, uh, you, can, you can essentially, you're trying to just re reverse that blight, the creep, uh, and start taking blocks back, and it, it, it is pretty effective if your government is well coordinated. Yeah, the other, the other point is, go ahead, Mike. The, the other problem we had in Glendale was the code enforcement had been uh, gutted uh, financially, so there, there wasn't a lot of resources to draw on there. That was a big problem as well. Yeah, and that's your big hammer. So, yeah. So a couple of good points come out of just that that uh, brief discussion there, and, and one that that Tom makes is that. It's also possible to identify some emerging problems. So even if <clears throat> what they're doing with that uh, system is you may have a single abandoned house on a block, but he's essentially thinking of it as an early warning system in anticipation of that block becoming completely crime-ridden and dilapidated, uh, developing some kind of a scanning system that alerts the police to uh, a future problem uh, might be even a, a more advanced uh, use of the scanning process. Yeah, I'd say if you have two, uh, you better uh, your 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 best approach is get with code enforcement and and uh, see if you can't uh, pressure the owners or get them to sell them or do something with them because you're well on your way to to uh, to a blighted to 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 the creep of blight. Yeah, and that further makes the point that you don't want to rely on just one scanning method. Because it may turn out, if you're only looking at the calls for service or the offense incident reports, <laughs> there are going to be some places in which maybe those are not being generated. You may have an emerging problem in that location, but it has not manifested itself yet in terms of calls for service or crimes. But if left unattended, it very well could. Mm -hmm. And it may be well, let me totally out of your control. I mean, older neighborhoods where the old folks die and the kids have moved to the suburbs and... You know, the, the Baltimore model was the addicts steal the copper out of the house, and then the, nobody wants to fix it, and, and there you go. So uh, you that's know, right. Get, you get uh, get early intervention, or you can hopefully uh, prevent that because it'll run away from you if you're not careful. Very good. Well, let's move on to the uh, the analysis phase of the problem solving process. And here too, we'll we'll likewise uh, talk about what are we trying to do with problem analysis. Um, the, if in the scanning phase what we've been focusing on is painting a picture of the problem as it exists today, how big it is, how much harm is being caused, why we should care about it, in the analysis phase we turn to uh, another question, a different question, and pr probably the most important question, which is 
Why is this problem happening? Why is it as bad as it is now? Why is it not as bad in other places? Why does it why is it occurring? This is and, and so what you're doing by analyzing the problem is trying to develop what I think of as a working theory of the problem, an explanation or a prediction as to why it's happening. This is uh emphasizes the near causes of the problem, not the distant causes. This is pretty important because we're not asking this broad criminological question says why why do people do bad things to each other? Why does crime exist? Why are there criminals and so forth? But the more specifically, why is this problem as bad as it is in this time, in this place, and involving this this degree of harm? We're really trying to get at very specific kinds of causes. We're also trying to accumulate evidence about the problem's causes. So imagine that we have formulated a theory of the problem. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to draw just quickly from the Glendale Circle K beer theft problem. After some analysis, they, they came to a rough hypothesis theory of the problem that Circle K's management practices, the way in which they, they marketed their beer and the way in which they put it out for sale, made it relatively easy for thieves to steal it. That was their prediction. That was their theory. And then they set about trying to prove that theory by gathering evidence because they knew that the Circle K management would 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 uh, object to that particular theory and say, no, it has nothing to do with us. It has, it's caused by something else. The accumulation of the evidence is critically important, and but it becomes even more important down the road when you begin to try to implement responses to the problem. Later on, you, as we'll see, when you try to respond to that problem, very often you're going to be asking other people to do things that they might not want to do. They're going to object to some of the recommendations that you make. They're not going to want to change how they do business or the practices that they that you think are causing the problem. In order for you to persuade people to make them do those things that they don't want to do, you're going to need some kind of evidence. And that's what you're, you're very much about in this phase of the process. And ultimately what we're looking to do is to discover a new, a more effective strategy. This is not just abstract academic research. This is practical research intended to come up with a better plan of action. In doing problem analysis, a couple of things to, to keep in mind and to, and to consider. As much as possible, try to keep the analysts who are working on studying the problem and the operations personnel, the police officers, the field commanders, closely linked throughout the project. We'll be careful that we don't, that the operations people don't just sit back and let the analysts go crunch the numbers in the back room and wait for them to, to magically produce some kind of a, a plan of action with all of the recommendations. Even though the operations personnel might not have all of the analytical expertise, they have the knowledge, the working knowledge of the problem. And that kind of communication between analysts and operations personnel throughout the life of the project should be maintained. Uh, in, in, by contrast, neither do we want to, once the plan of action is set, do we want to leave the analysts out of the picture and have the operations people just run with the plan and implement it. The analysts are can be critically important to every phase of the problem-solving process, helping to identify the problem, certainly analyzing it, but also working with the operations people, even in the in the implementation of responses. Because at every phase of the problem-solving process, there is need to gather data, to study that data, and to understand what it what it's telling us. The the theories of the problem or the hypotheses that we talked about previously should structure the analysis. What, what I mean by that is that if you come up with a particular theory of the problem, that should give you a clue as to what kinds of data you need to gather. In the absence of a theory about the problem, you could find yourself just wallowing around in, in a mass of data, not sure what it is you ought to be gathering, not sure what it is you ought to be looking at. The theory can help drive the analysis. 
Also, as a reminder, don't be limited to the existing data sets. That means the easiest thing for police to, to look at and to analyze would be the records management system and the CAD data. It's all there. We have the system in place. It's captured a lot of this stuff. It's relatively easy, not, not perfectly simple, but relatively easy to analyze that. But it may turn out, and we provide a few examples, in which that may not be the most important information. The most important information might not be routinely collected, and you have to be more active in seeking it out, in interviewing people to gain their perspectives, to get the depth of knowledge and understanding about the problem that doesn't just automatically show up in data sets. Both numbers and perceptions are important. Quantitative and qualitative analysis are quite important. We don't want to, to limit ourselves to one or the other. And we always then face this issue, well, how rigorous does the analysis have to be? How certain do we have to be that we've figured out the right answer to the cause of the problem? I don't have a hard and fast answer to that, but I like the notion of, of, of good enough analysis. By good enough analysis, in an ideal world, we would satisfy the highest standards of social science research in, in our proof. That isn't always possible. And sometimes the data just isn't there. The analytical techni the techniques aren't available to us. We don't know for certain. But it's always worth thinking about what's good enough in order to persuade key decision makers about the correctness of our theory. And whoever those decision makers might be, it might be the chief of police, it might be the common council, it might be the mayor, it might be the CEO of a corporation. Whoever it is you're trying to persuade to do something about the problem, think about them as your, your audience. What kind of, what degree of proof is good enough to persuade them of the merits of doing what you recommend that they do? In every part of the analysis process, we encourage you to think about the various stakeholders. And not just, uh, it's helpful to come up with a list, identifying all of those individuals, organizations, groups, agencies, that have a stake in that particular problem. And then try to understand what exactly is the nature of their stake or their interest in the problem. And keep in mind that we're not just, we're, this is not limiting ourselves to listing those people who are negatively affected by the problem, but also keep in mind that some people actually have an interest in seeing the problem be per perpetuated and continued. And some people, in many instances, for some kinds of problems, are actually doing reasonably well. They're making money off the problem, or they are somehow advantaged by the particular problem continuing as it is. You want to understand that stake, because understanding uh, who, who's got a stake in the problem and what the nature of their stake is can often lead to interesting and new responses. As an example, again, uh, work I've been doing with the Savannah Police, their focus, again, was on repeat violent offenders. But through an analysis of the various factors that contribute to why these offenders continue to offend at such a high rate, it led them to think about where these guys lived. And in thinking about where they lived and noticing that there was some concentration geographically where they lived, it led the... the SPI team to start asking questions about the places in which they lived. And they discovered that many of them were living in so-called rooming houses. And then that led the, the team to, to recognize that the conditions of those rooming houses, the management of them, the, 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 the fact that they were relatively unmanaged and poorly managed, was maybe contributing to why these guys were not properly supervised and, and, and how that might contribute to their offending. That whole line of analysis led the team to rethink and to put some kind of a focus on the owners and the managers of these rooming houses and to, and to understand what their financial interest was, what their other interests were in renting and not managing properties in a way that would discourage offending. And it, it launched the whole project off in a new, in a new direction.
parallel to the efforts to deal with the offenders, they're also dealing with the, the properties in which they live. As a resource to help you in, in problem analysis, I'd recommend uh, this publication. It was published by the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing and the, the COPS office. It's probably been uh, among the most popular of all the publications we've put out, and it's called Crime Analysis for Problem Solvers in 60 Small Steps. It was jointly written by Ron Clark, a criminologist at Rutgers University, and John Eck at the uh, University of Cincinnati. It's available, and I'll show you later on exactly how to get access to it. We also have published a, a variety of what we call problem-solving tool guides, and each of these guidebooks are intended to provide you with advice about how to analyze particular aspects of problems. This one, for example, uh, written by Scott Decker, one of our SPI subject matter experts at Arizona State University, is on how we can use offenders' knowledge about their offending to inform and improve our police problem solving. How do we go about get, getting the, the knowledge about the methods of operation out of the, the heads of the offenders? And the list of problem solving tool guides currently includes guides on how to measure effectiveness or assess responses to problems, how to gather research about a problem from other, other places and, and the research literature, how to analyze repeat victimization, how to work with businesses, how to understand risky facilities, how to implement responses to problems, how to use crime prevention through environmental design and problem solving, how to get the most out of crime analysis units for problem solving, and how to measure the possibility of crime being displaced, or conversely, having some extra bang for the buck in which it solves problems beyond what you intended it to. All of those guides are available from the POP Center. We're currently working on a few additional guidebooks that we hope to have published within the next year or so, one on understanding repeat offending, understanding so-called hot products or the, the common targets of theft, and then a more uh, extensive manual on how to apply the principles of intelligence analysis in the problem-solving context. So to summarize uh, the analysis phase, we're looking to explain what is causing the problem to be so bad. Again, not the, not the distant causes, not the general ones, not the root cause things, but the very specific near causes. We want to remember that the responses should, uh, should follow from these causes. So what we do about the problem should follow logically from our, uh, our analysis of them. The whole purpose of analysis is to help us develop a new and more effective response. We're looking to do good enough analysis, and we want to understand the stakeholders' interest in the problem. So we'll take a pause there and uh, open for any questions or comments. Okay, I think I will just uh, press on with moving on to the response phase of the problem-solving process. The response phase has really got three different objectives within, the, within this general phase. <clears throat> the first is developing potential new responses. The second would then be choosing from among those response alternatives that we came up with and the third would then be actually doing the thing, implementing the responses. So I'll take these in turn. Developing the potential new responses, we, we sometimes think of this as the brainstorming phase of the process, coming up with new ideas. Again, the responses that we come up with should logically follow from the lessons that we learn from the analysis. Like that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the responses should be tailored to the particular problem. Generic responses that we just sort of get off a shelf and, and seem to work somewhere else may or may not work with our problem, but it's almost always, where possible, preferred that we tailor that, partic that response to the particular conditions and context of our problem in our time and our place. 
And we do want to encourage a, a fairly broad and uninhibited search for new responses. And we know that it's fairly simple for us to come up with some of what I think of the standard police responses to crime problems. And I'm not discounting them. They, they can sometimes work and work quite well. But where we do things like extra patrol or crack down law enforcement, intensive patrol, uh, sometimes enhanced surveillance, there's nothing inherently wrong with those, but they're kind of the ones that come instinctively to mind and we're, we're likely to try. But we also want to push beyond those to think, what might we try that we have not tried before? What are some things we might try that, that police maybe conventionally had not done before? We're not necessarily at this phase committing to doing these things, but if we don't uh, open up our minds a bit to think about those possibilities, uh, we're, we're never going to, to entertain them. And I have seen very, very often that sometimes even the most outlandish ideas first presented, uh, even sometimes those that are initially suggested as a joke, uh, sometimes actually turn into modified somewhat to, to make them more practical pretty effective new responses that we might find years later everybody is now doing it but so many of the responses that we have developed and and come to rely on in policing in in 2011 were 10 or 15 years ago almost unthinkable because nobody had yet tried them and lastly we want to give some consideration to immediate versus long-term responses because you've identified these as problems that demand police attention, there is there is some political and community demand to do something about the problem. It, we do recognize that sometimes you just have to do something now, and that might be relying on some of the standard police responses, the, ex, the intensive uh, patrol, the intensive law enforcement, the extra <clears throat> surveillance, and so forth just to stabilize the problem or just to to maintain some kind of public support demonstrating that the police are in fact taking the problem seriously but always recognizing that maybe those immediate things that we do to stabilize the problem or to get a, a handle on it are not ultimately going to be the long-term responses and preventive responses to the problem so we can be we can be proceeding in parallel paths doing the things that need to be done right now while at the same time thinking about things that we might do that, that are going to have a longer-term impact. We do emphasize, uh, to the extent possible, thinking about alternatives to arrest, prosecution, and incarceration, responses that are, do not rely, not exclusively dependent on the operations of the criminal justice system. So to be clear about that, it's not to say that we want to rule those out arrest, prosecution, incarceration can be tremendously powerful and important tools. And in, in my assessment of effective problem solving, I find that very, very often some form of arrest, prosecution, and incarceration is often part of the effective solution to the problem. But there are reasons for us to be a little bit cautious in putting all of our eggs in that, in that particular basket. It's expensive. We can't control all of the operations of the rest of the criminal justice system. The system is not designed to handle large volume of cases. There are reasons of due process that are going to make it inappropriate uh, for us to put uh, large volumes of cases through there. And sometimes we can overuse the system such that the courts, the jails are so full that they no longer have that kind of, uh, of deterrent impact that we hope that they might have. So a number of good reasons to always to consider arrest, prosecution, incarceration, but never to be solely dependent on it. We do want to emphasize prevention. Obviously, a big part of the police role is to react to crimes that have already occurred, to investigate them, to comfort the victims, to try to protect people's lives and property. But, it, but the problem-oriented approach puts a heavy emphasis on thinking about preventing the next crime and further kinds of disorder. So what might new responses look like? Uh, this is not a, an exhaustive list, uh, using this imagery of a duty belt. There are lots of things on a duty belt. And, and the various kinds of responses that we need to be open to in policing might include some of the following. 
focusing on repeat offenders, victims, and complainants. That's intended, and, and this, we have this example from Savannah and elsewhere, where it's a more refined focus on a relatively small segment of the population of offenders, victims, or complainants, concentrating attention on them and doing something special with those individuals that's different than what the average individual receives. Issuing warnings. Uh, something short of a full arrest in which we, we let people know in various ways that their behavior is, is no longer going to be tolerated, but without committing ourselves to making that full-blown arrest and prosecution. Selective intensive enforcement. This is, again, is relying on the criminal justice system, but doing it in a much more selective and a much more intensive way. So it could be a crackdown enforcement at this particular time, for this particular place, under these particular conditions. Enforcing civil laws, uh, breaking beyond the, the, the notion that the police only exist to enforce the criminal law, and trying to involve uh, some of the lawyers in helping us think about enforcing civil laws that maybe had not been customary for us to use. A very good example, and now a common example, is the use of nuisance abatement laws against problem properties. That's a relatively new in innovation in policing in only about the past 20 or 25 years, uh, but one that we have now come to rely fairly heavily on. And there may well be other kinds of, there are lots and lots of different kinds of civil laws. We want to involve the lawyers in helping us think through how, what are some of those other laws that we might productively use. Creating and enforcing uh, new probation conditions, recognizing that many of the offenders that we're dealing with are already under some kind of court supervision and that we may not need to make new cases. We might just need to strengthen the relationship that we have with probation and parole officials to enforce those conditions. And so we had a lot of uh, uh, success uh, with that. Uh, I know the Lowell Police have been uh, going along with the, the probation officers on home visits to some of the, the identified targeted drug offenders in their community. I think about using mediation and negotiation. Uh, and those are those are principles and ideas and concepts that have uh, that have a lot to them, and and not the skills that, that police officers necessarily are, are proficient in. Uh, we might be able to refer, uh, especially lower-level disputes, to some kind of mediation negotiation process. A big one that we've become increasingly willing to use and, and expert in using is altering the physical environment. So this includes the crime prevention through environmental design, environmental <laughs> criminology, thinking about how we might redesign the community. Simple example, Philadelphia currently, uh, among the things that they're doing is working on removing abandoned buildings uh, because there's a recognition that the existence of the abandoned building actually creates, generates some opportunity for crime to occur in and around that building. Pressing for new laws that to control the conditions that create problems. Um, a nice example, I, I think, uh, comes out of Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, years ago, the, the police there dealing with a lot of burglaries to apartment complex, uh, apartments in a co apartment complex buildings, recognized that to a great extent the burglaries were made much easier to commit because the buildings were not properly constructed and they didn't have proper security uh, d built into the apartments, into the door frames, into the locks, into the windows, and so forth. And so the police department actually drafted and was able to get enacted a city ordinance that paralleled the fire department's uh, safety codes that said for apartment complexes in Overland Park, they had to comply with these very specific and very uh, precise uh, building codes that spoke to the security of the apartments and not just to their fire fireproof uh, nature. Conveying information, just letting people know uh, either how to avoid breaking the law or how to avoid becoming a victim. Uh, a nice example out of the SPI initiative, Palm Beach County is currently working 
I'm dealing with the problem of robbery of immigrants, mainly migrant field workers and others, and, and recognizing that part of the problem is many of these individuals don't access, don't make use of more secure banking systems because they, they lack trust in the banking systems or don't fully understand them. They've set about educating immigrants about simple and effective and more secure banking methods that would reduce the amount of cash that they're carrying around and reduce their victimization risk. Likewise, Reno police are currently working as part of their response to the prescription fraud and abuse problem on educating high school students about prescription drug risks. Cincinnati police currently uh, including some kind of robbery prevention information in their efforts. Reinforcing informal social control uh, recognizes that sometimes the threat of arrest and punishment isn't the most important thing in the minds of offenders and that somebody else's opinion of them might matter more than that of the police. And what the police then can do is to help support other people's efforts to exercise control over these offenders. That could be working with parents to exercise greater control over their children, teachers to exercise greater control over students, landlords over tenants, employers over employees, and so forth. So in a in uh, an interest, interesting way, the Baltimore police, currently working on gun problems, have created a gun registry kind of initiative. And if you think that through, you recognize that one of the ways in which a gun registry system might work is that it increases the publicity that a particular individual is uh, is known to, to, to carry guns. And that publicity could potentially increase the risks of that person feeling some sort of shame by being identified as uh, a, a, a dangerous person of sorts. It's a it's a creative use, I think, of of uh, leveraging the formal social control with a little bit of informal social control. Coordinating with other services, we met, again, police recognize they don't have to do everything by themselves. Oftentimes, whether it's dealing with mental health agencies, code enforcement, community development, and so forth, we can get other services involved to deal with particular problems. And lastly, sometimes mobilizing the community, reaching out, actually getting the community to, to take some action directly that would help address the problem. So again, an example out of Reno, one of the things that they're doing with, with to deal with the prescription abuse problem is encouraging the community to get rid of and to safely dispose of unwanted prescription drugs that otherwise, left unattended, could come, could fall into the hands of people who are going to abuse them. So these are just some uh, a set of ideas that we, from which we might draw in helping to, to to brainstorm toward new approaches. We can also take a look at some of the principles that come out of environmental criminology and situational crime prevention in which these theories uh, carefully developed suggest that in addition to increasing punishment for offending, there are at least 25 other techniques that we might be able to use. And these, and these 25 techniques cluster into five different categories, one of which is making it harder to commit the crime, increasing the effort. <clears throat> that could be by uh, target hardening, controlling access to facilities, deflecting offenders, controlling weapons, and so forth. Alternately, we could increase the risks of getting caught. We do this maybe by enhancing natural or electronic surveillance, denying people the anonymity of their offending, getting uh, place managers to do a better job of watching over people in particular locations, and so forth. Thirdly, we could reduce the rewards and say, the, the rewards for committing this crime are going to be reduced. All right? We might conceal the targets of theft. If you can't see the thing, you're not tempted to, uh, to, to take the thing. We remove the targets. They're no longer there and easy to, to steal. We just identify the property, or perhaps we, uh, we change the, the appearance or the design of the property so it becomes a little bit less valuable. Very clever response Charlotte Police in North Carolina used a few years ago to deal with the problem of theft of appliances 
out of homes, new construction homes. Thieves were stealing the appliances before the home could be secured. And the police analyzed the whole problem and came to recognize that they couldn't always wait to put the appliance in the house until the house was secure. And where they couldn't do that, uh, a simple way to make the appliance less attractive to the thieves was the simple technique of removing the door of the appliance. Take the door off the refrigerator, the door off the stove, the door off the dishwasher. And it was then that door was easily put back on later to make the appliance work, but at the moment the thief came in contact with it, the target of the theft was then rendered useless. What's the point of stealing something that doesn't have any value? Fourthly, we might reduce provocations. We recognize that almost all uh, uh, or many offenders are in some respect provoked into into committing the offenses. So we want to say in in, uh, in bars, for example, if we want to reduce the violence there, we try to reduce the crowding, we reduce some of the noise, we reduce some of the things that provoke people into conflict. And, or lastly, we might remove excuses, recognizing that many offenders, they convince themselves that what they're doing is somehow okay. This is very common with speeding, for example. You ask people, why are you driving over the speed limit? Why? Because everyone else is doing it. And if you can change that perception, you take away some people's excuses. I didn't know that it was against the law. Well, then we can make it clear this is against the law. A variety of techniques. And I encourage you to use this as a brainstorming tool for thinking about new ways in which we might deal with with problems. How do we choose from among the different options once we come up with a, a, a set of them? Well, we want to apply a set of criteria. Is it likely to work? Is it likely to be effective? Is it likely to, to prevent the problem in the future and not just help us catch the bad guys? How intrusive is it? How coercive is it? Uh, always trying to minimize the degree to which we have to intrude in people's lives. How much does it cost? We prefer the cheaper interventions to the more expensive, all things being equal. Do we have the authority currently, or do we incur any liability for trying it? You don't want to, even if the answer is no, we don't have the authority, it doesn't mean we can't get it, but it's certainly easier if we already have the authority to do this thing. And is there public support for it? Would doing this thing actually generate greater public support, not only for the police, but for the whole effort itself? Or might it undermine public support? And lastly, is it practical? Is it something we really can pull off without too much complication? As with the Problem Solving Tools Guides, we have a series of guidebooks that we call response guides. And each of these guidebooks then uh, explain how particular kinds of responses that are commonly used by police, how they work, what do we know from research about how effective they are against what kinds of crime and disorder problems, and then some discussion about if you're going to use this response, what are some considerations and how can you make it most effective. This one, for example, is on video surveillance of public places, uh, written by Jerry Ratcliffe, who's a uh, uh, working on the, the Philadelphia SBI initiative. Other guides in this particular series include police crackdowns, closing streets and alleys, shifting and sharing responsibility, which I'll come back to in a moment, video surveillance, crime prevention publicity campaigns, sting operations, asset forfeiture, street lighting, design of urban parks, and assigning police officers to schools. We also have a collection on the, the POP Center website of several thousand project reports written by police agencies, most of them submitted to the Herman Goldstein Award Program, but each of them describing how this particular agency addressed a particular problem and what results they had. You can search these by the name of the police agency or by whether or not the, the project was recognized as, a, as an award winner or by the year in which it was produced or you can simply type a keyword into the search engine and try to find these project reports. And some of these you will find actually connect with and are related to your own problem. Just yesterday I came across a nice example of the Indianapolis police 
developing a response to a domestic violence problem that they had read about as being developed by the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police in North Carolina some years ago, and they had to have read it on this uh, on this Pop Center website. Again, we turn lastly in the response phase to actually doing it. And the doing of the plan is almost always easier said than done. In my experience, this is where a good many problem-solving efforts have, have come off the rails and failed, not because they didn't understand the problem, not because they, they hadn't developed a good plan of action, but because it was poorly executed. And there are so many reasons why <laughs> These response plans are difficult to implement. Keep in mind, oftentimes you're tell asking people to do things they don't want to do, and there's going to be opposition to the new plan. The status quo is always more comfortable to do. And so it's very important to recognize that don't these plans of action will not be self-executing. They require intensive and careful management. I don't, want to, don't need to lecture you on project management, but just as a reminder, Treat these as you would any other major project, defining goals, setting standards, monitoring the progress, anticipating resistance, looking for opportunities to get things done, and responding and adapting to changing circumstances. The shifting and sharing responsibility, this is one of the guidebooks we have. I would encourage all of you to read at some point because it, it applies to virtually every kind of problem-solving problem that the police deal with. And it speaks to how you get others to do things that they otherwise don't want to do. And so we think about that. Sometimes it's a simple matter of supporting what's already being done to control crime in the community. Sometimes it's just a matter of asking people to do things that they hadn't thought about doing. Sometimes it's a broader education campaign. Sometimes you're in, enlisting another organization to help do something that they're perfectly willing to do, but they hadn't been asked. Sometimes if that organization and that service doesn't exist, you may be helping to create it, advocating for the creation of something new that needs to exist but doesn't currently. Sometimes you have to get a bit more confrontational and you make your requests with, uh, backed up by some threats of some more uh, serious action if they fail to comply. Sometimes you shift to public shaming, the sort of naming names and, and going public and, and letting the public know that certain individuals or certain companies or certain entities are not being good citizens. Sometimes you're withdrawing police service. You say, if you, if you refuse to do this, then we're not going to do this. A uh, classic example, many agencies no longer respond to gasoline drive-offs if their gas stations refuse to uh, adopt a prepay policy. Sometimes you may charge fees for police service. You say, well, we will do this thing, but you, you don't get it for free or you don't get it for your tax dollars. You have to pay extra because of the, the logic that you're consuming more than your fair share of police resources. Sometimes, using the Overland Park example again, you can mandate that people do things by passing a law that says they have to. And lastly, sometimes you need to file a civil action. Uh, again, the nuisance abatement actions are a good example to compel compliance. And all of these we think of as methods that police can use for helping to shift responsibility. And as the guide describes, as the resistance to your recommendations increases, so too does roughly the degree of coercion that you need to use to, to be persuasive. And usually so, too, to the amount of resources that are going to be necessary for you to get this thing done. And accordingly, this takes us back to our problem analysis, the, degree, the amount of evidence that you have to demonstrate that this particular response will work and needs to be done, that you have that evidence sufficient to persuade someone. So all of that, summarizing the response phase, we're developing potential new responses we're choosing from among the, the alternatives, and we're learning how to shift and to share responsibility, and we're actively managing the implementation. Okay, we'll pause there. Any any comments or questions? Okay.
Okay, I will just wrap up then with the, the last phase of the process, uh, measuring effectiveness, the assessment of the project. Why do we do it? Well, mainly to determine if the impact, if we had any positive impact on the problem. So ultimately what we're trying to achieve, less crime, less disorder, less fear, and so forth. And of course to try to figure out whether or not the reason we got that positive impact was because of our particular intervention. We want to know, especially if we are thinking of doing this thing again sometime in the future, whether the amount of time and effort that we put into uh, our strategy is paying off so that we know would it be worth doing again in the future in this police agency, in this jurisdiction, on a similar kind of problem or a similar problem in another part of the jurisdiction. And lastly, again, this is part of the whole smart policing concept, is not only so that we can, our, our community can benefit from our knowledge, but so too can the whole police profession. All of this measurement calls for measuring both the outcomes and the process. Both are very important. The outcome means what impact did the effort have on the problem that we identified. Did things get better? The process is also important, and it's a measurement of whether or not our plan of action was actually implemented. So if we say we're going to collect a lot of uh, unwanted uh, prescription pills as a means of reducing prescription abuse, then we do want to not only do we want to know whether prescription abuse went down, but we'd like to know whether we actually collected a lot of pills so that we can better connect the means by which this thing happened. How do we define success? In an ideal world, the problem just goes away altogether, completely eliminated. I will tell you, it does happen once in a while. Uh, not all that often. Um, sometimes the best we can hope for is we reduce the volume of the incidents. We don't go there as often as we used to. Don't have as many things stolen. Sometimes we can't even achieve that, but we can reduce the harm. Nice, easy, simple example is we think about seatbelt enforcement. And if you think about seatbelts, seatbelts do nothing to reduce the risk of a vehicle crash. They're all about reducing the harm that might come if somebody does get into a crash. Fourthly, again, picking up on the shifting responsibility, maybe the best we do is we shift the ownership of the problem to some entity that's in a better position to be able to deal with it. And lastly, sometimes the best we can do is to develop a more humane, a more fair, a more equitable kind of response while we wait ultimately for some uh, more effective response. And here, too, we have some guidance uh, available to you on the, the whole uh, process of assessment, uh, again, one written by John Eck on assessing responses to problems, a second one written by Rob Jarrett, Florida International University, on analyzing crime displacement and diffusion. So again, the summary here of assessment, both the outcome and the process assessments are important. We want to define success in a reasonable manner, tailor the measurement to the particular problem, and just like with the analysis, good enough assessment is a guiding principle. Good enough to persuade key decision makers that something good happened here. And lastly, remind ourselves, assess honestly. That it truly is just as important to learn from failure as it is to learn from success. Not only for our sake, but for any others who might read our work. Service, you know, and that said, all of this, a lot of this information available from the Center for Problem Oriented Policing website, uh, funded by the, the U.S. Department of Justice COPS office, uh, but all of this information uh, freely available to you, and I want to encourage you to, to take full advantage of it, as well as to, to take the time and effort to, to write up your own work, get it into the stream of, of knowledge so that others can benefit. And that's it. The leader has unmuted your line. Okay, so we have um, the world's leading expert on problem warranted policing on the phone here. Uh, if anybody has a question for Mike, I'd encourage you to just join in at this at this point in time.
Dr. Scott? Yes. I have one question. Yes, is, is there any reason? Is there any reason we could not interchange the word threat with problem from an intelligence-led policing standpoint and using this air model? Uh, I can't think of any particular reason. Um, tell me, tell me what what you have in mind by threat. Well, what we what our analyst does every day here is. He's constantly scanning to identify any threat. We look at it, and we bifurcate it in two areas, an order maintenance threat, whether it's loud music or, or problems in a neighborhood, or an actual violation of law threat, speeding in certain areas of the county or particular thefts in areas of the county. And we, we use the SARA model as a, as a uh, template to identify these threats and then come up with strategies and tactics to immediately mitigate these threats through our uh, intelligence products. Yeah, that sounds to me like a you know a perfect uh, application of it. Uh, you're just using threat as a synonym for for problems. If it works well in your jurisdiction, makes sense. It's understandable to your people. I'd say that's that's just fine. That's great. Uh, the only advantage to using some kind of common language, whether it's problem analysis, assessment, so forth, is just it makes it a little easier when we're communicating across jurisdictions. But I don't see that as terribly important. I don't want to get hung up on the, the terminology where the, it's really the concept that matters, and I think you're using it just fine. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else? Well, um, well let me just offer a few thoughts as we close up here. Um, Mike, I want to thank you again for... Uh, Really putting a lot of effort into this presentation, I think uh, you've <laughs> you found a way to you know collapse a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience in a very short amount of time. And I know it's a it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes to do that, but I appreciate the effort here. Um, I would just encourage everybody. Uh, Mike Scott, as I said, is head of the Pop Center. He's a subject matter expert with Smart Policing, and so if questions come up after today and you want to address them to him or to us, we know where to find him, and I think he would be happy to help anybody who had any questions about this as you go about implementing your projects. Uh, I, I do like the way we ended up uh, talking about analysis and assessment. I can tell you this, uh, BJA in, in funding smart policing and in funding the various sites is obviously, you know, uh, historically and has always been interested in supporting law enforcement and supporting innovation in law enforcement and supporting justice system improvements. I think more than they have in the past, they're very much concerned with how much evidence we are developing to uh, build our knowledge base and our confidence that these innovations are actually having a positive impact. And so when, when you engage with smart policing, whether it's through webinars or through our meetings or through our website, you'll find a, uh, a strong focus on the research and analysis and assessment piece. That's become a kind of a rallying call for everything that we do in smart policing these days. And uh, in support of that, our next upcoming webinar is actually on research and evaluation with Scott Decker from Arizona State University. Vivian, are you on the line? And can you t tell us what the date for that one is? Yes, that's December 12th. December 12th, so uh, simply by the fact that you've engaged with us in this webinar or in prior webinars, and if you haven't already, you'll get a notification about that. Uh, as I would with any other webinar, I encourage you to find the time and join us for that one as well. As I said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to us or to, you know, uh, direct them to Mike through us, and we'll make sure to get them. Uh, Vivian is going to send you out a uh, evaluation of this webinar in, uh, very soon, and as I said earlier, please pay attention to that. Uh, it will help us figure out how to present these in the best possible fashion, and if there are other topics or if there's a follow-up uh, focus topic and problem warranted policing that you'd like us to present on, just let us know that, and, uh, and we'll get to work on it. I'll tell okay? you what I think about it. And thank you all very much. Mike, thank you again. My pleasure.